the Lord this morning. Thankful you are here. Thankful that the Lord is going to meet with us or he already is meeting with us. So grateful for his goodness and his mercy, uh, how he's brought us all this way and all the way to October. Isn't that crazy? We're here in October. I feel like we just started summer, just got to May. Here we are. We just transported all the way to dark evenings and uh, in uh, cold evenings. But praise the Lord, we have a place here that we can come and gather and worship the Lord and uh, really just focus in on him. I read an account of when I don't know what Asian country it was, but they um, they Christianity gatherings for Christianity was outlawed. And so these new believers started meeting in a park and uh, or, or these believers started meeting in a park with these new rules. And, and they got some complaints that there was a, a gathering in the park and it wasn't, it wasn't sanctioned by the government. So the officials came, I believe the police force, whatever they were called, and, uh, and they, they had set it up so they, would, they had a, a decent-sized group of believers and they would celebrate somebody's birthday every Sunday. It's a birthday gathering. We're celebrating their birthday. And they're like, oh, that's fine. You can have a gathering. I don't know how long it took for the government to get wise to it that they were having a birthday party every Sunday at the park. But I thought, Lord, if we go the way we're going in America, we might have to get in Benham. But until then, thank God that we're here. And, and I was able to walk across the parking lot. You were able to get inside of your car and sashay your way to church here this morning. Aren't you thankful that we live in a country where, for now, we're free to worship God? It doesn't matter what Hollywood or the media says about it. We're allowed to worship God. I'm allowed to be a Christian. And when it becomes unallowed, I'm still going to be one. But I'm going to rejoice in, in the freedom that I have here today. Praise God. Praise God. Stand with me, if you will. I'm just rejoicing uh, in, in that this morning. I don't know why that's been on my heart. Brother Mike taught so wonderfully on prayer this morning. And you know what? Even, even if we're locked up in prison, we still have an advocate with the Father. We still have an avenue to God Almighty. Hey, we and better than that, today we don't have to worry about that. We can worship God like he deserves to be worshipped. So let's do that this morning. Lord, we love you. God, we're grateful for you. You are wonderful, Lord, in all your ways. God, I pray that you would minister and move in this service. God, Lord, let the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart, be acceptable unto thee, O God. In all our ways, Lord, we acknowledge you today. God, we ask you to direct our paths. Lord, we rest in you today. God, I pray that the Holy Ghost would fall in this house. Thank you for bringing so many that have been out sick over the last few weeks. They're back here today. God, we praise you for that. We thank you for it. God, we pray for those that aren't able to be here today. God, we pray for Sister uh, Crystal Ship. God, that you would touch her body, Lord, right now, even as I speak her name. God, that you would send the word and all glory will be unto you. God, for Brother Roy Priest, Lord, thank you for what you've done for him this week. And God, I pray that you'll continue the healing in his body. God, even as you would, Lord, today. God, we lift you up, Lord. We thank you, God, for all your goodness and all your mercy. And God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with Mandy as she sings.
night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day you're worthy of it all I was thinking this morning before service was just praying just just you know sometimes when you're praying you just say certain things in your prayer and you feel the Holy Ghost just connect with what you just said and I was thinking while we were talking about how God deserves all the praise all the glory I thought about the rock you know he's been such a rock that I could stand on and I was praying and I just got so happy in my soul Outside, you could say, oh, that was just the wind you were feeling. But I begin to feel just the presence of God, and I begin to reflect over my life. Never was there a moment that the rock sank. I'm not talking about just any rock. I'm talking about that rock, Jesus Christ. I got so happy as I started rehearsing that in my soul, church, that never has there been a moment when the ground shook, the rock didn't shake. When the winds blew, the rock stayed, remained steadfast. What a God we serve. What a God we serve that no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter what time's bringing, no matter what seasons come, He doesn't ever change. He remains the same. Can you tell me any other God like our God? There isn't any other but one. Muhammad died. <laughs> and he remained in the tomb that he was placed in. Buddha died. <laughs> and he remained where he died. But our God promised us. He said, listen, I'm going away for a little while. But they can lay this body down. They can lay me in that tomb. But I promise you in three days, I'm going to get up. Can I tell you, we can go to the tomb today, Brother Parker. And we can look inside that tomb and we can see an empty tomb because our God kept his promise. Our God kept his promise and the angel told him, why come ye seeking the living among the dead? You see, we go to funerals and cemeteries to visit the dead. He said, but here, he's alive. He's alive. Can we sing that one more time? And, and I just don't feel like we were really singing it like it deserved. I don't really feel like we were acting and acknowledging He's so steadfast. He is worthy. He is unmovable. Can we just praise him like we really mean it? I know sometimes Sunday mornings you got to shake them cobwebs. Trust me. I know. I look at my kids' faces when I'm trying to shake them out of bed, Brother Larry. They're not happy. But you know what? Isn't it something when we shake all that drug, you know, getting just the, the tiredness off? You know what we're going to do this morning? We're going to shake that off. 
You know what we're going to do? We're going to acknowledge Jesus is alive. And we're going to give him the glory. That's what we come for today. What other reason are we here today? I'm so glad for everybody that's here. But I'm more glad that I get to acknowledge that Jesus is here. So can we just give him a prayer?
Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy, Lord. There is nothing worth more, oh, than his presence. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. Oh, thank you, God, for that fullness we feel. Oh, satisfaction in God, contentment in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you have a need in your body, won't you just step out in the aisle if you're able to? Just step to your left or right to the closest aisle to you. And, and if, if you don't mind, we're going to have somebody lay hands on you that's by you. Ladies and, and gentlemen, if you'll, if you'll look around you, there's a few. I want at least two people praying with every person that's in the aisle. There's two in the back there. There's... One over here on the side, one in the front. Girls, girls up front. Go lay hands on Sister Crystal this morning. Need one more to go pray with Sister Naomi. Praise the Lord. There's Sister Jennifer in the back. Sister Rambler's right here. Jesus. Sister Nancy, will you go and lay hands on Sister Jennifer there in the back, right behind you? Just lay hands on her. We're going we're gonna to activate our faith here today we're going to activate our faith whatever your need is god is able to heal you right now brother roy brother roy would you lay hands on brother mike here if you're able this morning no no get up here by brother buzzy buzz lay hands on him lay hands on him all right y'all let's let's pray not pretentious prayers but real prayers that are fervent asking for God to send the healer right now. Lord, we love you. God, we're thankful for you. God, we praise you that you do all things well. You do all things well. God, from the front to the back, there are people that have stepped out. And God, they have stepped out as Peter did on the water this morning in faith, not in human power or understanding, but they stepped out in faith. God, I pray that you will send the word, God, and touch these bodies. God, for Brother Jaden, Sister Naomi, God, for Sister Jennifer in the back, Lord, for Sister Crystal, Sister Ram Rambler, Lord, and Brother Mike in the back. God, we believe this is ministry. We are laying hands like the church is supposed to do. God, we are believing. The power doesn't come from the pastor's palm, but it comes from the master's presence. God, today, in the name of Jesus, God, send the word and let healing be accomplished in their body. God, you are doing a work right now. You are doing a work right now. God, you're completing a work or you're beginning a work, but God, we believe that you are doing what you will here today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You that are getting prayed for right now, I want you to slip a hand up toward heaven and say, thank you, God. Nobody's looking around. And let's worship God for a moment for touching us. 
Let's praise God for a moment for touching us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing. Thank you, God, for touching. God, from our head to our foot, you are the one that knitted us together. God, we believe that you are a healer, and we praise you for that healing. God, that you're sending us this day in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, the name that's above every name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're faithful. You're faithful. Even when you can't feel him, he's working. Even when you can't see him, he's moving. Oh, trust God today. Trust God today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, so thankful for his presence. The goodness of God is here because he is here. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated if you're able. If you want to keep worshiping the Lord, go for it. It's a Pentecostal church. We're not against pray, pray, praise or prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want, I want you to remember this Friday night, we have service at Valley Worship Center. And uh, that is in Smithport, PA. Um, it starts, I believe, at 730. I know at 730. It starts then, so remember that. And then there is... Gabe, will you take these here? Go put them on the table in, in the foyer out there, buddy. Thank you. Uh, if you want, that is for the fall, uh, not festival, what's it called? Con convention. Thank you. Fall convention. It starts in the first Friday, the first Thursday of November. So be remembering that. We're going to support that and, uh, and move our service there on Thursday night. And they have service on Friday night and Saturday morning and afternoon. So take advantage of that. That is November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Cannot believe we're almost there, but we are. And so remember that next Sunday morning will be our, our youth-led service again. Excited about that. Uh, we were going to do it today, but us getting back this week from Missouri, um, we just moved it back a week. Uh, that's the good thing about being pastor. I can just make the schedule work for me. Praise the Lord. So y'all remember that. Be praying over that. Young folks, get with Sister Amanda and see what, what's going to happen that day. Then also remember, uh, Sister Linda, when is our Christmas play? Lord, help your voice. The, the 11th of December. She croaked at me there. And God help her this morning. We're thankful God's brought her through that. Uh, with the help of some antibiotics that were created by the Lord. So we're thankful for that. But um, anyways, um, be remembering that, be inviting people. Make up excuses to invite, invite people to church, all right? You don't have to make up excuses. Uh, we make up excuses in a lot of things in life. Make up an excuse to invite somebody to church. Say, hey, I had you on my mind. If you're talking to them, they're on your mind, right? Invite them to church. Let's see what God will do, but especially during um, the, the, that youth service next week, uh, next Sunday morning, and then that Christmas play. That is a tailor-made opportunity, tailor-made opportunity to invite somebody to church. Praise the Lord. We want to get people here because they have a soul that is going to live on eternally. That's what the vision's for. It's not so our pews will be filled. It's so heaven will have more people in it. And hell will have less, right? It's, it's simple when you put it that way, ain't it? Have an everlasting soul. Praise the Lord. Grab your Bibles. Turn to 2 Timothy with me. Chapter number 3. I feel an unction this morning, and I'm thankful for that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And once you find that, then we'll, we'll in a little bit, we'll be reading in 1 Samuel chapter number 2 this morning. I was trying to... Um, even living out here in the country where things are a far drive to get to, it just seems like you don't go um, to the city as much um, as, as we thought we would need when we first moved here. And so over the last few years, we've only put a, uh, not really a whole lot of miles on our car. As I was thinking this summer, I think we put more miles on our car than all of last 
year and a half of the year before. Um, and, and you know what? I, I, I was thinking about that, and my old melancholy temperament could get in there and say, and say, well, uh, Lord, you're opening all these doors, and the gas prices have been the highest they've ever been, you know. But it, it's just a privilege to get to do something for God. Whatever it is God calls us to, I was telling the young people um, last, last youth-led service, um, we all met in there before service, and we were kind of going over the expectations, and I want them to know that ministry is not a microphone. And, and so that Sunday morning, I was trying to describe what ministry was, and that, that is a blight in a lot of small churches is, uh, is you get so used to being used a lot that if, you, if the Lord moves you to another place that has uh, more people, you get used less in this ministry. Um, but uh, what's awesome is that this isn't just the only ministry. There is so much, so much, and I'm thankful for that. And, and I got to illustrate a way that I was used in the ministry that morning. Uh, and, and um, you know, there are different ways that we can be. But here's the thing in all of it. This is me preaching here this morning. I don't want to go through the motions. Praise the Lord. I don't want to go through the motions. I want to be uh, have right, right motions, yes, or right actions, but I want to have right motives, right? My heart doing the right thing for the right reason, right? Uh, Jesus had the biggest problem with the Pharisees out of anybody that he had problems with in the New Testament. And one of the things he said was, y'all, y'all will tithe of even your spices. Y'all have a herb garden and you bring it in and you tithe of this and that. And he said, that's good. You should do that. But don't neglect these weightier things. Don't neglect even more important things. And he went into uh, motives of the heart. And, and so today I want to preach about manifold motions. Manifold motions. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Billy, it's good to see you, man. Appreciate you getting to be here this morning. Thankful for that. Thankful God has brought him uh, here this morning. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 1. Uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, verse number five, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Let's read that last verse uh, again. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away away. Lord, I pray your blessing on your word this morning. God, I pray that your anointing will be present, that will destroy the yoke. Lord, we need your help, Lord, this morning. God, I pray not only for myself to be anointed, but God, for those all under the sound of my voice, for this spirit of God to fall on them, to water the ground of their heart, to break up follow ground. God, that they might receive Lord, the seed of your word, that it will bear fruit in their lives. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. My friend Robert uh, texted me just randomly the other day. We hadn't been talking, and he texted me, and he said, Jeremy, if you were to write a commentary on any book in the Bible, what book would it be? And, and, and I, responding uh, just quickly to him, I said, Second Timothy. Um, my, my Probably, as a young preacher, my most read book, there for a while, I read it three times a day um, and, and, and read the book of John three times a day, and it's between those two. But, but there was something my soul longed for in these verses. I didn't understand it. Then understand it, but as I'm I'm getting older, I'm seeing how poignant these verses are. 
uh, for today. I know Paul was writing to Timothy, and it was Paul's last book um, that we have preserved, it, chronologically his last book of his life that we have preserved, the last letter he wrote. But it is something that is prophetic for today. Um, when, when we read all that list in the last days, what men will be, it, it could be very plainly, he could have wrote it last week about today. Uh, he, talking about the motions that people go through. It is not just motions of, of people that are not religious, but it is motions of people that are religious as well. When you read through that list and you see it, and, and he ends it at least as such, that little thought of the blurb of what we read of the scriptures, he ends it with saying, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Denying, having a form, but denying. We can, we can, I don't remember who it was, probably Brother Noah knows who it is, but that, one, that man who wrote, I don't want to go through the motion. Do you remember that song? I don't want to go one more day with all his all-consuming passion uh, living inside of me, right? I, I, I'm not a huge fan of that man's voice, but the song's wonderful. There is something powerful uh, about those. I don't, I don't want to live my life going through the motions. And, and as I thought about this message and as I began to prepare it, I thought how sad it is. I testified Sunday night at the or Thursday night at the end of uh, at the end of service this past Thursday night about an evangelist who backslid on God, and I thought how sad it is that he drove all the miles that he drove, and and he, and he prepared all the messages that he prepared. He prayed all the times that he prayed. He worked the altars all the times that he worked the altars. He beat his body down traveling, and and then backslid on God. I don't want to go through the motions. There, there is something about this thing that's worth hanging on to. You hear me today. Uh, it, it doesn't, when you've got the heart right, when, rather when God has got the heart right in you, it'll change how you do what you do. There, there won't be the struggle that goes on. See, you can have a form of godliness like the Pharisees and you can come to church dressed up like that uh, sister or that lady that Brother Mike wrote about that, that, that cussed the preacher out at the end of church. She was dressed the part, but her heart was not in it. There, there was something that she denied. She denied the power of the Holy Ghost in her life. I don't want to be able to speak in tongues. I don't want to be able to shout and dance a jig and then not affect how I live on the outside of those double glass doors back there. Just walk my way to work and live a totally separate life. Let's turn over to 1 Samuel now, chapter number 2. And we're going to use a biblical example and narrative to try to express this thought to us here this morning. Let's consider some that had a form but denied the power. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. I'll turn that there as well, but we're just going to read at first. Keep your Bibles open, please. But first, we're just going to read the first part of verse number 12 of 1 Samuel 2. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. See, these were fools that chose against God's presence. The fools that chose against God's presence. See, they were in the motions of rebellion. See, they were priests, but weren't interested in serving God, only in serving themselves. That phrase there, sons of Belial, it speaks of, a worthless and wicked men. In the original, it could have been written that out right there in the pages of Scripture. Sons that were worthless and wicked men. See, they, they, they stole sacrifices. This chapter tells us, and, and the following chapter tells us of their folly, but they stole sacrifices. They, they insisted on immoral relationships. 
they made men to abhor the offerings unto the Lord. Can you think of anything more grievous than people who lived in such a manner? That's why I've been on a kick here lately, y'all, of, of, of warning us who we listen to, who we feed ourselves with, because when they live in a life uh, a lifestyle that is contrary to God, they might say mostly the right things. But that's why we need a spirit of discernment. Discernment doesn't tell us uh, what is altogether wrong. Our common sense can tell us that. But discernment tells us what is just slightly off. There's something there that I don't understand, but, but it makes me uneasy. We need to live that spirit of discernment. But see, these men were in such outright rebellion against God that their actions as ministers were so foul that they made the men and women of Israel to abhor giving offerings of worship unto God. See, they were living out the motions of rebellion. But the, the, here's the thing, and, and I'm probably going to um, mix these two points in together, but I want you to hear it here today. They would take things that were supposed to be done a certain way and they would do them their own way. And they would say, this is what we want. I guess we can read that in the next verse. I want you to notice one key word there. In verse number 13, it says, the priest's custom. You hear that? That word, the priest's custom. With the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants came while the flesh was in seething with the flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. See, they had changed up some things. They would bring and boil a, a portion to, to, to clean it, and, and so they would stick into that boiling water. They would stick a three-pronged hook in, and they would scoop out the sacrifice, and they would let it sit there, and that was the priest's portion. That's how the priest could eat. Um, they would bring their tithe into the storehouse, but then their offerings were how the priests could eat. And according to other passages in the Old Testament, the priests was, were to receive, and this is from the Levitical law that God gave to Moses, the priests were to receive a portion of the breast meat and the shoulder. That was the priest's portion of the sacrifice. So every sacrifice that they would bring in they would carve out, it was a butcher shop, they would carve out that portion of meat from the breast and the shoulder. But we read in this verse number 13 that the priest's custom, not the priest's commandments, but the priest's custom. 400 years after the law of Moses, the priestly customs had changed. And here it is. The, the children lived the motions of rebellion because their father lived the motions of reluctance. My God, that's good. Lord, help us here today. You see, Eli had followed command, or rather customs over commands. I'll do what I feel. I'll do what I, I, I desire to do. Instead of going by what God had told him to do in the book of the law, that they still had active uh, a readership on. They hadn't lost them as of yet. Verse Samuel 4 and verse number 4 now, the next couple chapters down, it says, So the people went to Shiloh, that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. Here it is, the motions of rebellion, reluctance, and then thirdly, the motions of rejection. They, they are going through the motions of serving God daily in the temple. They are making people to abhor serving God. And then we get to this port right here. We know that the enemy comes against them, and, and they raise up an army to fight the enemy, enemy and it comes into the army commander's mind. Hey, go get the ark like we used to do. 
You bring the ark out here and we'll win with no fault or failure. But here's the problem. When they would do that and bring the ark into battle, it was one, because God had commanded it, and it was two, because they were living right before God. You cannot have God's blessing in your life when you're living contrary to the principles in God's word. You cannot have it. It is, it is no wonder why some people are living a life of devastation when they're going against the principles of God's word. And what did God do in this case? He rejected their uh, uh, lucky rabbit foot religion. He rejected it. And it is stolen by the Philistines. It is taken. As I was praying in one of our many journeys in the last few months, I was praying over this scripture, had both of my ear pods in so I could drown out the roar that was in the car. And, and I, 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 was, I was curious about this scripture. I began asking God about it. And, and I know that's dangerous, all right? Uh, I also went to study out the word, what's already written. But, but here's one thing that stuck in me after my prayer was how long was the ark gone? How long was it gone? And I know many, we've, I probably knew this at some point in my life, but it just slowly leaks out of my brain here. But it, when seven months was in Kiriath Jerem, or rather in, in the land of the Philistines, and we know how Dagon, they put it in the temple of Dagon, and he fell over. And then they set him back up, and the next morning he fell over, and part of him was broke off again, and the head was broken off. I love that story. And then they were stricken with, with ailments in their body, we'll say. And, and so, so seven months, and they said, you know what, this is ridiculous. We're going to bring in two cows that have never, have never pulled a cart, and, and they, they got calves at home. We're going to see what they do, put it in a brand-new cart. They did honor to the ark of God, they put it in a brand new cart. As far as the world can give God honor. They put it in there, and those cows, instead of going towards their calves, like is natural, and to their home, they carried it straight off to this place that I, uh, I, I said earlier, Kiriath Jerem. And there it abode for 20 years. 20 years, approximately, and seven months. The ark of God dwelled there. You see, the ark of God is a representative of the presence of God, the tangible presence of God. But not only that, it houses the mercy seat. You understand that? The top of the ark, and there's cherubim reaching out over it. The top of that was the, the mercy seat. And so for the once yearly offering of the offering for sin, the atonement offering, and not to be gross and not to damage your delicate uh, mind here this morning, but they would shed the blood of that offering. They would pour it into a bucket, let it drain completely out into the a bucket, and they would carry it into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Then they would pour th that offering out onto the mercy seat. Can you imagine the smell? Uh, we, we get these pictures of the Holy of Holies like it's just, but just the stale blood and the stench that it would bring of a slaughterhouse. But God, in his mercy, would receive that blood offering, right? He would receive it and forgive the sins of Israel for a whole year. And they would walk free in Jesus, praise God, uh, for a whole year. There it was right there. The mercy seat's gone. Now mercy is gone out of Israel. 20 years, 7 months. And here's what got me praying in the car. What did they do in those 20 years during the offering? What did they do? I, I felt a, 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 I, I, not literally, but a figurative lightning bolt from heaven when that hit me. What did they do during that 20 years? They went through the motion. I, I, I researched, Brother Google, help me, praise the Lord. I researched and researched this, and I could not find during that 20-year span what they did. But Jewish history lists in the Second Temple Age, when the, when the ark was gone, what they did. There was a, a stone laid out. There was a stone laid out where the ark of the covenant would sit on. And they would put a shovel full of coals onto that, that 
uh, foundation stone, let's call it. They would pour it out, the, the high priest would, and he would get it all ready and, and piping hot. He would go in and get the blood from the sacrifice and carry it in, in the bucket, and he would pour it upon the stones again, pretty much to get rid of it, to burn it up so they could clean it out. They were trying for a less bloody religion, for one. There's all kinds of preaching in there that, that I'm 20 minutes in and I can't do it, all right? And it, no matter how bad I want to. But they were going through the motions. And see, there's, a, there's many people who do what's right in their own mind. They, they, they come to church. They say, this is my duty. This is my priestly service, right? Pastor, you said, aren't we all uh, priests, high priests, after the order of Melchizedek? Are, are, aren't we those priests? We are believers, and that is true. But we must be careful not to go through the motions of religion. That that is what has gotten us to where it has gotten us in America today. It hasn't been a 20-year problem. It's been an 80-year or longer problem in America where people have went through the motions. They ask young folks why they backslide or why they quit serving God after they turned 18. This is a Barna stat. And many of them, I believe the quote of the people that left, 70% said they saw a religion uh, that was different at home than they were living in church there are people who were going through the motions of religion I know that's not always the case but I do believe often it is see there is a manual to be followed right that's not a, a, a Spanish name right there is a manual to be followed there is this to be followed and I and and the the more uh, the older I get, the more seasoned I get, however you want to say it. I am understanding that, that as far as we're getting away from God in America, according to the manual, judgment will come. You cannot, I, I, I'm telling you, Lord help me this morning, you cannot do what's popular in society and neglect the word of God and expect God to bless you. I'm not talking about man-made additives that you can't find and you can't support, but I'm talking about precepts and principles in the Word of God here this morning. You cannot do it. You can't say, oh, I'm a believer, but then you don't behave what you believe. That makes you a hypocrite. So, so these men went through the motions, and they were rejected because of their motions going. But I want us to turn now to 2 Samuel chapter number 6. Lord, help us this morning. 2 Samuel chapter number 6. I'm sorry, I should have told you to keep your Bible handy. Why don't we just do that going forward when I'm preaching? All right? Let's keep our Bibles handy. Verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. We talked about a, a fool, or fools, that chose against God's presence. But let's look at a follower that chased after God's presence. 2 Samuel 6, 1 and 2. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were there, uh, were with him from Baal of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. We know following these verses that David tried to do it the world's way. He tried how the Philistines tried it, right? He brought, got a new cart, gave honor to the new cart, or gave honor to the ark by getting it a brand new cart never used before, and hauls it, and we know that the ark hits a bump, and, and Uzzah tries to steady the ark and touches the ark because it had become common to the people. You understand, it wasn't common to David. He was trying to do the right thing, but he did it the wrong way, right? And we can't preach that here this morning. But, but we know Uzzah was struck dead. David was offended at God over this, and he was fearful. And he called a man named Obed-Edom. He said, take this over into your house. Put it there, and we're going to leave it there for now. Now, the more I studied this out, the more excited I get. I'm not going to get ahead of myself here. But skip down to verse number 12. It was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, 
and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Praise the Lord. See, this is the motion of requiring. David required God's presence in the kingdom that he led. It wasn't enough that he had a good relationship with God without that, that, that signifying presence of the ark of God. But he knew what the ark of God meant in, in the grand scheme of things to Israel. They needed God's mercy. They needed it. So, so David did not want his kingdom to go through the motions of spirituality as it had under the reign of King Saul. Instead, he desired to lead how he lived. Psalm 42 and 1, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I've, I've wrongly attributed this to David before, and, and that's just my ignorance uh, and, and, and probably not taking the time to study it out how I should have. But, but it was the sons of Korah that wrote that scripture, that song. They sent it off to the chief musician to, to put some melody to it. And, you know, the sons of Korah, they were Levites from the family of Kohath. And by David's time, it seems they served in the musical aspect of the temple worship. Second Chronicles describes that to us. But here's the thing. Back in Numbers 16, during the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt into the promised land or into the wilderness at this point, Korah, the, the patriarch of their family, had led a community rebellion against Moses during those wilderness days. And John and God rather judged Korah and his leaders, and they all died. Every single one of those leaders died. But praise God, he extended mercy to the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah. And Numbers 26 tells us that his sons remained. And I believe, as they wrote this, As the deer panteth for the water, so panteth my soul after thee. Oh God, man, I feel like preaching here this morning. Praise the Lord. There is something that they understood greater than maybe any other family in Israel is that they were being used to worship the all-holy God, the king of the universe. They were being used to worship him when they shouldn't even be alive. God Help us to realize that, how they required God's presence, even though they knew that they did not deserve it. They were so grateful for the mercy of God coming back home. I would not be surprised. It's written in the, in the Bible. It's not plain, but I would not be surprised if the sons of Korah were some of the musicians and singers, maybe the worship leaders that were playing and singing as David danced before God in 2 Samuel 6 with all of his might. Uh, he danced before God to music. They were there, I really believe, worshiping God. They recognized both of them. David did because he knew he was not a perfect man. And the sons of Korah, they knew that they had no right to be in the place that they were in. But they realized that the mercy seat of God was coming home. But because they were humble before God, they realized that they couldn't just go through the motions of a false worship anymore. But there was something inside of them that recognized, God, thank you that the mercy is coming home. Praise God. David wasn't a perfect man, but he was a man after God's own heart. Praise God. He chased after God. He refused to just go through the motions. To go through the motions. And I want to and I want to show you what happens to a family that won't go through the motions. Here it is. We talked about fools that chose against God's presence, a follower that chased God's presence. But here it is, a family that was changed by God's presence. We talk about Obed-Edom, verses 10 through 12, tells us a little bit about his story. David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. 
for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God, because the mercy seat was there, because the presence of God was there. They didn't earn it. It was just there. You understand that? Praise God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Here it is. David had the motion of requiring God's presence. But here it is. Obed-Edom's household had the motion of respecting God's presence. I don't believe in my study, and this is my opinion, all right? I preface it with this. This is the K.J. V commentary, the King Jeremy version commentary, all right? But, but I don't believe Obed-Edom's family was just picked at random because of the rest of the scriptures. See, he, he was probably, and Jewish history tells us this, that yes, he was a Gittite, or rather from that area, but Jewish history tells us that he was probably a Levite of the family of Kohath. First Chronicles 26.1 tells us that. This was a family within the tribe of Levi that God commanded to care, take care of the ark in Numbers 4 and 15. Here's what that means, all right? Because the ark of God was out of the country, it was removed off from where it should have been. Obed-Edom lived without a ministry for 20 years. It was his family's job to make sure nobody touched the ark, that make sure nobody brought it by way of the cart, that it was carried correctly, that it was cleaned properly, that it was stored properly, that nobody could come close to it. He lived without that ministry for 20 years, and when they got it the way that the Lord blessed them, it lets me know that they took care of God's tangible representation on earth. The ark was there and they cared for it and respected it. Why would God strike someone dead who disrespected it, but then not and bless somebody who didn't respect it at all? We know that Obed-Edom respected the ark of God, that tangible representation of God on the earth. He lived without that ministry. Can you imagine being called to something and not getting to do it for 20 something years in waiting and waiting and waiting and when he got the chance can you imagine how he acted oh this is getting the best room in the house y'all it's getting a master bedroom we're cleaning that thing from top to bottom they could have had surgery in that place before the ark was dropped off in there it is holy unto the Lord the mercy of God is here let's do everything that we know to do to reverence the presence of God tell you church if we want the presence of God and the blessing of God in our family and in our church we better do everything required to be reverencing him and him alone when you care for God's presence and you come for God's presence how God said to you will be blessed with his presence I'm not talking about cash and Cadillacs. I'm talking about the presence of God in your life. You hear me this morning. The presence of God in your life. The motion of respecting. Lastly here, the motion of relishing. Obed-Edom's family, so affected by the presence of God that it says in 1 Chronicles 15, 24, lists off all these names, and it says they're the priests. Did blow the trumpet before the ark of God. But here it is. And Obed-Edom and Jehiah were doorkeepers for the ark. He left that business, that family-run business that had been so blessed. They, they, the whole nation knew about the blessings of God on his household. And he said, boys, you're going to have to run the harvest this year. I've got to be in God's presence. I've got, I've got to 
leave everything aside, and I've got to get to where God has for me. Oh, God, help us. But once you have truly tasted of God's presence, going through the motions will never be enough. It will never be enough in your life. I want to ask you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning, if you will. Is God's presence preeminent in your life? Is God's present presence preeminent in your life? I want to be where God is. I want to go where God calls me to go. I want to live how God has called me to live. There's something that you'll never be able to purchase. Stand with me if you will. You'll never be able to purchase it. You'll never be able to work it up in yourself. You'll never be satisfied with what the flesh can do. But in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. Obed-Edom got a taste of God's presence. Obed-Edom got a taste of what God had called him to do. And he said, I don't care if he's been blessing this for all this time. I've got to go to where he is. Lord, I pray, God, that you would add your blessing to this word here today. That in this time of altar, God, we will die out to self. Lord, and we will draw close to you. God, I, I pray. God, that we will be followers of you that chase after you like David was. I pray, God, that we'll, we'll be families, Lord, <laughs> that must be right before you, that must revere and respect your word and respect it enough to say, I'm going to eschew evil. I'm going to walk away from those things and I'm going to draw up as close as I can to you. God, I pray that at Mount Zion, we don't, we don't say, oh, well, the world will say this. Or we need to be seeker sensitive. Or we need to be this or that. God, I pray that we will say, Lord, whatever your word says for me, that's what I want to do. God, in those areas where maybe it's not black and white in the word and we have to follow after you. God, I pray that we'll be like Obed-Edom. That we'll do it the right way. The way that you say to do it. God, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Before you step out to pray this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you feel God drawing you to be in relationship with him this morning. If you need to be saved, I want to tell you that the Lord loves you and he wants to save you. The Lord doesn't want you to go through the motions. But he wants you to be right with him. Here, here we are at this moment. We ask you, won't you yield to God? Church, won't you step out and pray? The rest here, won't you come to God and bow a humble knee before him and see what he'll say to you this morning?
and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i made it and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i made it when it's all about you it's all about you jesus king of endless worth no one could express how much you deserve oh though i'm weak and poor all i have is yours every single breath i'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you required oh you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, because it's all about you. It's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus King of this worth nothing could express how much you deserve oh song for a song in itself is not what you have required no you search much deeper within through the way things appear and you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart because it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i made it when it's all of all about you all about you jesus i'm coming back to the heart of worship you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord the thing i hated when it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all it's all about you, Jesus. 
together. 